Johannes Vermeer was a painter of light. He lived and worked in Delft, in the heart of the Netherlands. But little else is known about this artist, the names of his masters, the nature of his training, the period of his apprenticeship all remain mysteries. He left no letters, sketches, or drawings. We know only of his genius. His paintings have intrigued and fascinated viewers for centuries. The themes he chose to paint were those he encountered in daily life. A girl reading a letter in the center of a sunlit room. A figure at work. A woman pouring milk. A girl in a red hat, her lips parted, her eyes lit with expectation, looking at us. What is it that draws us in? Is it the poetry and power of the images? The use of reflected light? The saturation of color? The softness and yet brilliance of the image? Or the sense of timelessness, its mystery and meaning? The celebration of ordinary tasks and daily life filled with quiet contemplation? the frozen moment in time, its intimacy and mood. A room filled with inner thoughts. Or is it simply the virtuosity of an extraordinary craftsman? What is it that makes a Vermeer a Vermeer? There's a greater sense of light, I think, in Vermeer's painting than there is in anybody else's. And the light bathes a room. It lights on the figures. The figures seem to glow. Some of them seem to have a light almost within themselves. And there is this brilliant, brilliant use of light that nearly always comes through a window, which is on one side of the scene. One of the fascinating things I noticed is that you never see the outside. You never see a tree through the window. You only see the light coming through. But it is this light that is incredible. His use of this light playing on the various textures that he wants to portray, which have all their different meanings. The supreme quality of Vermeer's light is, a, is the daylight effect. The clear daylight effect is extraordinary. Daylight permeates his shadows. And you, you see that so beautifully in The Milkmaid. As you look into that corner of the room where there's a wonderful still life of some kitchen implements, a brass pot and a wicker basket, you're seeing the, the whole thing, but you know it is in shadow. And one of the most beautiful things in the picture is the wall in the back of her. And the gradations of light or the intense light on the right side of the picture. And those gradations go from the most intense light to a darker light. But the shadows are transparent. There's always this clarity of form. The forms are never lost. There's another thing that's exciting about this picture. It begins to have a kind of pointillism. And if you look down at the loaves of bread, you got those solid forms, but in them, he has these touches of light. He's broken his forms with these little points of light. And he uses that so effectively, and he uses it beautifully in the view of Delft, those boats, which are in the lower right-hand corner there, those little, little touches of light, which means that the light bounces onto these dark forms. And it's wondrous to behold. The Woman of the Bells is one of those supreme examples of Vermeer as an artist. Light coming in through the window is gently illuminates the whole interior. It's a sort of a soft, deep, rich light. But it's wonderful to watch it happen, it's wonderful to watch it evolve. And Vermeer gives you the sense of light spilling across the interior of that space. It passes by that orange curtain. You can see how 
the light goes from behind that curtain, hits the wall directly, the gray of the wall, and then it passes through the thickest part of the curtain, and it's a deep, dark shadow at that point. And then as it hits the edge of the curtain, it creates a golden glow that links together the gray of the wall and the, the deepest part of the shadow as it, as it comes into the room. And then the light passes down, illuminating the table and the gold and the pearls on the table, coming across, caught by the edge of the table, and then your eye is drawn by her hand as it rests on the table, and you're brought back up to see her face, this wonderful, quiet, gentle face with her downcast eyes as she looks down at the balance as she holds in her hand. Light draws you in and encompasses the full scope of the painting. Harnessing light is central to the power of Vermeer. He transformed paint into light in the most brilliant and mesmerizing way. He seduces us very quickly, Vermeer does. There's a magical quality to his work, beautiful, it's simple. But that's very deceptive. He's concentrating all the time. He adjusts reality. If you look at the art of painting, there's an artist in an easel we see him from the back, and he's painting a woman, and she really represents history. And there's a map in the background, and the foreground is set so beautifully with the great carpet and the wonderful chandelier. Oh, all those details are ravishing. But where is the right leg of the easel? If you follow it down, you see the top of it, and you come down, and you see the artist is seated on a stool, and his foot is forward, but there's no leg of the easel. So where is that leg? If you look in that area where his leg is forward and there are the two legs of the stool, if the leg of the easel came down there, it would confound that whole area. So he's either hidden it behind those two legs of the stool or he's eliminated completely. And if there's ever proof that Vermeer is not an ape of nature, he, he just does doesn't paint what he sees, he makes adjustments. His pictures are so calculated, carefully. You don't see the calculation, but I assure you, he has calculated his effects. He's concentrated. There's tremendous intelligence at work here, artistic intelligence. Vermeer designs his paintings so brilliantly, so carefully, that every part of the painting, every drop of paint, Every line, every nuance of color has a deliberate meaning. A meaning in the composition, a meaning in the poetry, part of the story, whatever it is, everything has a meaning. One of the most wonderful examples is the woman in blue reading a letter. It's this single figure who's standing in a corner of a room and she's holding this letter and you can see the kind of emotional intensity of her experience because just the way she clasps her arms by her side. But Vermeer locks that gesture into space by placing those hands right over 
the very strong horizontal bar that is the bottom of the map that hangs on the wall behind her. So this horizontal bar at the bottom creates this tense concentration on those hands. So the result is that you feel that nothing can move. Light also enters into this equation. While there are all these beautiful shadows and subtle shadow effects throughout the painting, she casts no shadow. By not casting a shadow, he somehow separates her out from time. The sense of passage of time that one senses with shadows and the moving of shadows doesn't exist with her. So it enhances that whole sense of permanence. It's very hard with Vermeer to separate one thing from another because they're all so interwoven and interlocked. And the woman holding a balance is another example. It looks as though she will never move. It's in large part created by the gesture of the hand holding the balance because that hand is locked in space by being juxtaposed over the vertical and horizontal elements of the frame. The little finger is extended horizontally, it just holds that hand in space and then Vermeer reinforces that visual juxtaposition with a perspective. If you follow the perspective lines, go right back to that finger, that extended finger. The perspective of the table, of the mirror on the wall in front of her, all receded to that one point. So that vanishing point reinforces the importance of that gesture. And it's very interesting in Vermeer all the way through his career to see how he uses perspective, where he places the vanishing point, because the vanishing point tells us where he wants the eye to go. An explanation of everything making, uh, having a really serious part of the composition is in the woman with the balance. When I first examined that painting before the cleaning, the frame of the Last Judgment lying behind the woman was entirely black. In the X-radiograph, you could see the frame on the right side of the painting, behind the woman's head, had two light lines coming down. These light lines show that there was a density there, a dense material which could have been white lead or lead tin yellow. Further examination showed that this frame had been overpainted by somebody, not by Vermeer, very much later, and that two gold lines, actually they were bright yellow, had been painted out and painted with a dark grey. When that overpaint was removed, the composition came to life because you've got on the right-hand side the two gold lines, you've got on the left-hand side the light coming in and the gold-yellow curtain, and right in the centre is the gold little bit of her dress. And there are these three very, very important points creating the strength of this composition with her holding the balance. Without the gold lines of the frame behind, the composition was just failing. It just didn't have the tension and the meaning that it now has. And that is a very good example of how every little thing in Vermeer's, every little point, every little mark, has a meaning and has a purpose. Nothing is left to chance. Vermeer's masterwork, The Music Lesson, clearly shows that nothing is left to chance. On the far side of a sunlit room, a woman stands playing a virginal. A man in elegant dress watches her and listens intently. Both figures are quiet, as though the music were measured and restrained. This is one of the most refined of Vermeer's works. He carefully calculated every aspect of its composition. The figures, the musical instruments, the mirror, table, tile patches and chairs, however realistically presented, are conceived as interlocking patterns of color and shape. Vermeer's placement of the vanishing point creates a dynamic and clear focus. It falls on the sunlit sleeve of the woman. A halo of reflected light and color emphasizes its importance. We can actually see the hole in the canvas left by the pin Vermeer used to construct the perspective of the painting. The power of this work grows out of Vermeer's use of linear perspective. 
the sharply receding wall on the left, coupled with the pronounced orthogonals of the window frame, leads the eye quickly to the woman. She becomes the fulcrum around which the painting revolves. Vermeer further compresses the space by filling the right side of the scene with a large tapestry-covered table. The angle of its receding edge transports us quickly back to the vanishing point. The floor also plays a significant role in the perspective construction. Its strong diagonal pattern leads us directly to the woman. The interlocking series of rectangular shapes surrounding the woman adds visual emphasis to her importance. Vermeer creates a strong vertical focus by placing the mirror directly above the lid of the virginal so that the bottom edge of its frame is overlapped by the top edge of the lid. By including the woman's reflection in the mirror, he underscores her significance within the painting. The placement of the man and his relationship to the woman was of concern to Vermeer. Infrared analysis reveals that he first painted the man further forward and leaning more toward the woman. She likewise had a more active stance, her head twisted back in his direction. Vermeer subsequently altered the figures. The woman now stands directly facing the virginal. Seen from behind, her face is hidden from the viewer, but her image in the mirror was left as originally painted. He moved the man slightly, placing him in a more upright position. These adjustments were subtle but crucial. Vermeer transformed the figures from active poses to statuesque ones, emphasizing the permanence of their relationship. The effect brings them into harmony with the carefully ordered space. Vermeer uses color to strengthen the focus. The yellow-white of the woman's blouse the golden color of the virginal, and matching reflected light on the back wall highlight the figures. The red of the woman's skirt and Vermeer's selective use of black on the mirror, the virginal, the clothing of the two figures, and the pattern of the floor help lock our eye into place. The combination of overall contrasting colors, patterns, and shapes create major and minor accents focused on the theme of the painting. Vermeer preserves the privacy of the couple by creating an intimate space through the arrangement of objects on the right. The strategic placement of the chairs and the bass viol on the floor lock the couple into the background, protecting their private communication and separating them from us. The forward position of the table and the placement of the painting on the back wall reinforce their intimate space. By placing a chair directly between the table and the vanishing point, Vermeer interrupts the perspective line, slowing down our immediate access to the couple. We are outside, looking in. The white, elegantly proportioned picture sitting on the table is central to the composition of the painting. Its form echoes the curve of the gentleman's arm, and its color helps to link the foreground to the background. The purity of this form gives it an almost sacramental character, symbolically reinforcing the theme of comfort and harmony provided by love. The mirror is one of Vermeer's primary creative tools. Using the mirror, Vermeer allows us to look down on the woman, the carpeted table, and the tiled floor of the room. The sensitivity with which he has rendered the reflection is remarkable. He set it back into the mirror rather than placing it on the surface by painting the forms softer and smaller and by depicting the distorted reflections along the mirror's beveled edge. Vermeer uses the mirror to give us another viewpoint of the woman, revealing her most inner thoughts. By leaving the woman's original position in the mirror, gazing at the man, he suspends that psychological moment forever. It is this poetic image in the mirror that draws us emotionally into the heart of the painting. 
Vermeer manipulated the angle of the mirror for that purpose. Here we see the tilt of the mirror as he painted it. But in order to actually see the scene the mirror reflects, it would have to be drastically tilted by more than 30 degrees. Vermeer manipulated reality to intensify the psychological power of the painting. Understanding the potential of light is a primary aspect of Vermeer's genius. Here we see the room as it most likely would have been lit given the clues the painting provides. Vermeer then selectively manipulates the light to strengthen the focus. He eliminated the shadows that should exist on the back wall to create an evenly illuminated white surface, providing a backdrop to emphasize the silhouettes of the figures. While Vermeer drastically reduced the shadow at the top of the virginal to allow the upper wall to be gently bathed in light, he darkened the shadow at the base of the window and distorted its angle on the wall. These two divergent shadows hold the virginal in place, the upper shadow leading the eye to the corner of the lid and the lower shadow drawing our eye to where the leg meets the floor. Vermeer manipulated the shadows beneath the virginal by placing them closer to each other than they would really be, giving them greater substance and emphasizing the silhouetted shapes of the legs. He eliminated the shadow of the virginal's body against the rear wall in order to reinforce this effect. Vermeer completes this masterpiece by inserting his own presence. Showing the reflection of his easel in the top of the mirror, he reminds us that the artist is clearly present and in complete control. He is the master of what we see. The Little Street is one incredible painting. It's really the one I would most like to have at home. It's one of these paintings that somehow brings you back to your childhood, it makes you remember what it was like to be a kid, to look out across the way and see life going on just like it always had gone on. You'd see the woman sitting there doing her little thing, you see the kids playing on the street, you see the little maid in the back, they'd been there time after time after time. You know, something very comforting about this world. It's a very contained world. It's this view of a street, but you, it's what's interesting is you don't feel like you need to go left or right. You're very happy right there. You're very happy. You don't want to go anyplace else. Vermeer somehow has created a sense of a street, and you don't want to walk down it. You just want to stay and look at this little world that he's given you. And one of the magical things, one of the reasons that that happens is because of that red shutter. That red shutter says, stop. That red shutter says, you've gone far enough. You don't have to go any further. So that red shutter is really important to blocking, you know, limiting, to giving that sense of comfort in that world he's created. To the left of the door, you see that there's not nearly enough space for the shutters on the two windows to the left to completely open. So Vermeer has actually adjusted the architecture of the building, widened the space between the window on the far right and the door to allow that shutter to open flat because he needed that red there. He knew he needed that red flat against the wall in order to complete that composition. So there is a wonderful example of color being used for compositional purposes. He's a colorist from the word go. Uh, from the very beginning, he's a great colorist. And what changes in his color is from a warm tonality, from reds and yellows, to the yellow and blue, to the cool. And then the silvery quality of his light. And I don't think he divorced the light from the color. It's all of a piece. He can get the sheen and the texture in, in a magical way. Vermeer does this. You paint satin, it really looks like satin crisp. You can almost hear it. And the pile of a rug, or the bread, the crustiness of a bread, the color is doing that. Or the water in the view of Delft, the viscous water. 
it, it, fabulous, or the color of the, of the clouds. And mind you, that vault in the view of Delft, that sky, is just unbelievable. You know, you say that uh, Vermeer copies nature. Nonsense. Those clouds, he organized those clouds. Clouds aren't that way. Clouds don't stand still for landscape painting. He has to figure out, how am I going to arrange them? And he keeps them horizontal. So you have a sense of the great vault, and then of the heavens, and it goes back to the horizon. And he's doing that all with color. His color is intense. He can use one color next door to, door to another with the most brilliant intensity. There's a great example in The Girl with the Red Hat, where she is wearing this beautiful blue costume. And the highlights, instead of being lighter blue, which is what you would expect, are yellow, which is opposite to blue, and therefore creates this shimmer. And this is, this, nobody else does this. It is absolutely extraordinary. And that painting is a brilliant display of color. She's sitting against this rich, woven tapestry, marvelous interweaving of these shapes, all of which are brilliantly placed, not one has a little thing out of place. They all play a part in getting this fabulous sense of this moment, of this girl turning towards you, catching the light on her face and in her hat. And it's a brilliant, brilliant piece of, of observation and translation of that into this painting. When you're able to hold the girl with the red hat in your hands, that is a very special feeling. And in doing that, you really sense the artist at work. There's a whole different relationship that you have at that time. Little things that are hard to pick up in the gallery. For example, Vermeer gives this radiance of her vision with a little turquoise highlight that he puts in her eye and this wonderful pink highlight in the mouth. It's little accents like that that just make it come alive and have this kind of vivid quality. Vermeer works in glazes, very thin glazes, and the blues in particular are very thinly painted. He uses natural ultramarine, which is a wonderful, pure pigment. He prepared that area of the, of the blue robe with a reddish-brown underpainting, and that gives a certain warmth to the blue. So when he paints it very thinly, you have this warm glow that comes to the background. So it's not just a cool blue, it has this inner warmth that ties it in to the red of the hat and the orange of the cheeks and the sort of the whole humanity of the image comes across through that means and he uses his material and his techniques to enhance the, the emotional and psychological qualities of his work. The girl with the red hat is a sensuous painting. It is intimate and immediate. She communicates directly with us. Vermeer's use of color drives the emotional power of this painting. He sets the figure against the muted tones of a tapestry, concentrating color on the flame red of her hat and the lushness of her blue robe. Vermeer established an ochre base for the background of the painting. The soft tones of the tapestry elegantly emerge from that color. The lion head finials define the foreground and place the figure in space. Quick, strong strokes suggest the basic contours and structure of the heads. Using reddish-brown color for the base of the robe, Vermeer covered it with deep blue to establish its form. The brown bleeds through, and the combination of colors creates an extraordinary sense of warmth. He applied a delicate blue glaze to define the folds of the fabric. His use of thinly painted glazes creates depth, and the addition of ice blue highlights provides a shimmering quality. The face is established first in shadow. Vermeer used an opaque, deep red-orange paint as the underground for the hat. The red is an intensely warm and active color. It heightens the immediacy of the girl's gaze. 
A succession of semi-transparent strokes of light red and orange creates the feathery appearance of the hat. Vermeer demonstrates his sensitivity to the effects of reflected light by placing a dark purple hue on the underside of the hat. He subtly casts an orange-red reflection across the girl's face to accentuate the effect the red has on the viewer. He then uses green, the complementary color of red, to create the shadows on the face, enhancing both colors. Vermeer paints the cravat in a brilliant white. After laying the white down, he scraped away some of the paint to create definition. The white in the center of the composition cradles the face and focuses attention on her expression. Vermeer draws upon the power of light to increase the intensity of the color and to animate the painting. Adding soft and shimmering highlights that crystallize the form of the finials. Yellow highlights to enhance the blue of the robe and accentuate the quality of its color. Delicate strokes, finishing the texture and lushness of her hat. And highlights on the earring, nose and lips to bring the face to life. His crowning touches are the placement of the pink on her lips and the turquoise in her eye. Vermeer's extraordinary use of color encourages a dialogue between the viewer and the girl and enhances the sense of poetry that flows throughout his paintings. Vermeer was trying to emulate effects that he would have seen in an optical device called a camera obscura. Some of those qualities of this immediacy of looking out of this more momentary character of this painting may in, in fact be partially explained by the inspiration of the camera obscura. Now he didn't really paint from a camera obscura, he certainly didn't copy the camera obscura, but it was a way of seeing, it was a way of enriching the way he saw that he then would apply and create and adapt in paintings such as this. Camera obscura means darkened chamber. Its images were seen as magical in the 17th century, often described as nature's paintings. Its process is simple. When the camera faces an image on the outside, Rays of light enter into the darkened chamber through a convex lens on the front of the box, projecting an inverted and reversed image on the surface of the glass viewing window at the back of the camera. The image contains optical effects, such as diffused or soft highlights. 
This is an actual black and white image of a lion head finial as seen through a camera obscura. The impact of this optical effect can clearly be seen when we place it next to Vermeer's painted finial in The Girl with the Red Hat. Those finials are a marvelous example of what you will see from a camera obscura. They're slightly out of focus in a way, and yet he's managed that light on them in the most brilliant way. The highlights are made by building up layers of paint, starting with an opaque layer then building translucent layers, one on top of another, and finishing with little spots of bright white light. And those spots of bright white light are intense. And, and in fact, they, they remind me of the pearls that you see so often in Vermeer's paintings, where he does exactly the same thing, where he puts this circle of translucent white paint, grayish white paint, to create the roundness of the pearl, and then this little blob of white paint in the center which creates the light. It's exactly the same way that he paints the finials. It's, it's quite extraordinary. I think the most magical moment, perhaps in all of Vermeer's work, is in The Lace Maker. What a wonderful painting. And you have this woman, this intent woman, who's busy with her activity of lace making. In the foreground, you have this thread spilling out of this cushion, totally diffused. I mean, you cannot make out what these are. This incredible, unfocused quality of these threads. It's amazing. And that is such a wonderful example of what one would see in a camera obscura focused closely on an individual. You focus the image on the face of the individual, and the foreground then gets entirely out of focus. With the veneer, there's this marvelous softness where outlines are soft. Every layer flows into one another. And so you get this fabulous sense, this poetic sense of light and movement, whether it be on a tabletop, whether it be on a wall, whether it be on a person's face. Everything is very, very soft and flowing from one layer into another. There are no hard edges. To look at a Vermeer through a microscope is an extraordinary experience because you see all this flowing, all these soft, soft edges. You wonder whether you're looking at the edge of the finger or something else when you're looking at a woman's hand. So soft are they. And he achieved this by painting wet in wet. Now, this is very simple. He would put down one layer, let's say, of opaque paint while it was still wet, he would put another layer on top. And because the underlying layer was still wet, they would meld together, soften together. The edges would just blur a little bit. And there would be this flowing of these edges. So if you have a number of layers, one on top of the other doing this, this is creating this extraordinary sense of atmosphere diffusion of light, this marvelous feeling of the form without having to describe every little fine detail. And a very good example of this is the little street in Delft, the house which has this facade of a brick wall, where if you look at it, you think that every little brick has been painted very distinctly. Absolutely not. When you look at it, it's the texture which gives you the sense of all this brickwork, not every little brick. And so he's creating this movement throughout the whole surface of the painting by this technique of painting wet in wet. It's quite ingenious. There's illusion of texture in Vermeer's work. The most extraordinary textual effects are probably in the view of Delft, and I think the view of Delft is really amazing because there's this view of this city seen from across the waterway and across the harbor, and yet it seems so immediate, so real. There's something so intense about that view that it just comes out at you, and it's color and it's light, but it's really texture that is at the core of that. And, and he does lots of different things to create this effect in this painting. One of the amazing things, if you look at the roof lines, and the different types of roofs, the orange tile roofs on the left, for example, have a kind of a bumpy character that he creates 
by having a sand layer mixed with lead white underneath the paint. So it's a lumpy base specific to that area. So he very consciously wanted to create the effect of texture three-dimensionally. And then he puts on it the orange and little highlights on top, little, little dots on top of it. Then when it comes to the boats, this wonderful feeling of light flickering off the water onto the sides of the boats that he does without any three-dimensional texture, but with all this handling of paint with these various diffuse layers, these little circles, these diffuse highlights, and then the uh, opaque highlights on top of it, very interweaving of, of thin and thick and thin and thick. It's different in different parts of the painting, but it's all to serve a certain effect. It's really interesting to, f to photograph it from here because everything always seems out of focus. It's one of these strangest things. And even restorers have been bothered by this. And this painting, the woman writing a letter, is, is a wonderful example where when we brought it into restoration, the arm was in fact quite precise in definition and we discovered that in fact the restorer had made a contour line along that arm to, to make it defined in space, sort of losing the whole quality of light that Vermeer was creating. That is so unlike Vermeer. I mean, Vermeer did not create hard edges. They were all soft. And this repaint was quite clearly much later than Vermeer. And having established that this paint was false, it was removed very easily with no damage to the underlying. And there you see this typical lovely soft edge to her arm as she leans rather, she caresses the table in the same way that she's caressing the letter which she's writing. It is the most intimate, quiet painting. In fact, I think it's the most quiet, soulful of all of his paintings as, as far as I'm concerned. Part of the magic of Vermeer is to create more than he, than he actually has put down. The, the, the sense of more there than there is. And that happens a lot with color. And color, uh, he uses color so selectively and you feel this wonderful yellow of her jacket. But when you look at it carefully, you see, in fact, that there's very little yellow there. It's only in those highlights where the light is hitting the form that he's actually using the lead tin yellow to give that focus. For the rest, it's really done in ochres. It's very subtle, very understated. And this is something that he does throughout his career. It's, it's this suggestion of form, suggestion of color, suggestion of space done with the most minimum of means, the suggestion of narrative, suggestion of emotional energy. The feeling of mood is, is just the hints of these things. So what happens then is that we complete them. He leaves lots of room for us to enter into these things and for us to become part of the whole experience, to create it, to fulfill it, to finish it in our own you know, individual ways. Vermeer is a man of great dignity. And we see it in, in his mature works in a beautiful way. The servants are as dignified as the mistress of the household. And the milkmaid is to me a masterwork. And it's a serving woman that he's representing there. It's not the dignity of humankind because it doesn't embrace all of you, but it's the dignity of women. I love it. And I love women. <laughs> there is this wonderful sense of this love of women which comes through on every occasion. None of his women are hard. None of them are angry in any way. They're all concerned with fairly daily occupations, very gentle, very warm occupations that he seemed to enjoy. To me, one of the most moving pictures, the most poetic pictures, by Vermeer is a painting in Berlin of a woman putting on a necklace. And that gesture of a woman doing nothing but just about to clasp the pearl necklace, that's something no writer can do. You can, you can only see a woman put on a necklace. But to have captured that moment that to me is one of the most beautiful things that Vermeer ever created.
It's the life of women that he's painting. Men don't come in very often. But women reading a letter, women writing a letter, women delivering a letter, this quiet existence of women, that's much of the poetry of Vermeer. What makes a Vermeer a Vermeer? That's a very difficult question. I've been worrying about that question for about 60 years. For me, it is that extraordinary quality that he has of inviting you in and keeping you away, that en enigmatic feeling that he creates. He is telling you a story and yet there's almost like a veil between you and the painting. There is not an immediacy between you and the painting, although you're fooled into thinking there is one. There's something so personal about a Vermeer painting. It's one of these kinds of images that you really want to see all by yourself. You don't want to be interrupted. You don't want to hear noises around you. Oh, you can't put it into words, really. Just as you, when you see a great baseball player, when his form is fabulous, what makes him so great? Or there's a great cook and they have a great meal. What makes it so great? Well, you can talk a bit about it, but there's always something you can't put into words. He raises these scenes of life into something that is very, very special. How come that a milkmaid just pouring milk into a jug can produce this moment of magic on a canvas? This extraordinary sense of light and moment in which you feel there is so much depth, there is so much more than just this simple domestic act. And he raises up these, these pictures into this, into this ethereal level, which is very hard for us to compre comprehend. And he really is a genius at making these scenes quite magical and quite mysterious. At the same time, it's so universal. There's something about that image that is meaningful to all of humanity. There's truths, there are underlying truths, of, there are fundamental truths about human existence. There are sense of harmony, of life, the relationship of man and nature, the joy of life, the sense of, of possibility in such an understated and subtle way that you just come back to it over and over again and just feel enriched by the experience. makes a Vermeer a Vermeer? Perhaps there is no single answer, but rather it is a combination of answers which is different for each and every one of us. This is at the very heart of what seeing is all about.